Hello, everyone. Test, test. Hello. Okay, so hi, everyone. Hello. Okay. So um, I would like to welcome uh, Hanoi Bergs, and he'll reveal to us how to migrate 25k lines of end code to Gradle. So Hanno, you have the word. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining me uh, in the session and choosing this session. Uh, migrating 25,000 lines of end scripts into Gradle. Well, it's not an easy task, I'll admit. And um, I would like to share with you uh, some of the experiences I had while trying to migrate this, this great load of end scripting to Gradle. Um, but first, let's hear about who is this guy actually? Well, my name is Hanno. I'm from the Netherlands. It's a very small country in the West Europe. Um, earlier today, I had a conversation with, uh, with some of... Uh, some Bulgarian folks, they are very, very kind people, and they ask me, have you been to Amsterdam, and have you, uh, you know, eaten the cakes, and, you know, smoked the, well. And I told him, well, I guess when you live that close to something, it's not really interesting anymore, you know, because, but he said, I live very far from Amsterdam, so I really want to go there and try it. Um, so, <laughs> the Netherlands. Um, I have been a software engineer for over eight years, and I work at a company named Info Support, um, which is based in Veenendaal, which is the center of our country. Um, and the talk I'm giving today um, is based on some work I did at one of our customers, which is um, the Dutch train company. And I'll, in Dutch, they are called NS, Nederlandse Spoorwegen, which translates to Dutch Railways. Uh, so I will refer to this company as NS also. So when I say NS, you know, this is the Dutch train company. Um, and the Dutch train company has um, many software products uh, running at the moment. And one of the products uh, that is running uh, right now is a mainframe system that tries to manage all the train movements in our country. And um, over 6,000 trains uh, uh, are riding uh, the railroads each and every day in the Netherlands, so it's quite a, uh, a complex system. But it's it has been built in the late 70s, so it's quite old. It's a mainframe system, and we're trying to replace this with uh, a Java equivalent and, and trying to improve the functionality. And um, when we started that project, uh, we inherited some end scripting that people uh, and people told us this is very good end scripting. You should just take it and. Uh, thank us and uh, thank us for such a lovely, lovely present. Well, I wasn't present at the time uh, because, well, I, I wasn't uh, at this project uh, uh, at that moment. Um, but um, I would love to have been there, you know, and tell them, please don't let us inherit this end scripting. Let us just start over and choose a modern build tool that we can express our build uh, logic in. But, well. Uh, fate decided uh, the other way around, and uh, we were stuck with some end scripting that we had to use uh, until over, uh, just over a year ago, when we decided to replace it. So that's what this talk will be about. Um, as a software engineer, I have worked with uh, uh, and Maven and Gradle uh, recently, so um, the things I tell will come from my experience in these three fields. But first, I have asked for some uh, help, some reinforcements, and I've carefully selected three experts um, in our uh, IT domain that will help us uh, make sure that um, well, we, uh, we, we won't stray off uh, the, the good roads. And the first one is a man called Linus Torvalds. I hope you know this guy. He's the creator of a little operating system called Linux. Um, and he also thought of a version control system that you might have heard before, it's called GET. The second expert we will consult is Mr. Mark Reynolds. I don't know if you ever met this man, but he's the chief architect of Java. And the third expert that I would like to call upon later in the session is Mr. Louis van Gaal. <laughs> Do you know this guy, Louis van Gaal? I don't know if you follow the British football. 
Well, he's a fellow Dutchman, of course. Um, that's the only thing I have in common with him, actually. <laughs> um, but he is uh, known for some pretty um, clever remarks and also blunt remarks, actually. Uh, Kees Jan mentioned this in the, in the keynote, that Dutch people are very blunt, very to the point, and sometimes rather rude, actually. And this man excels at being rude. Um, oh, I have to update my, update my slide, actually. I don't know if you have followed the news. This man is the former manager of Manchester United, as of this week. So, uh, let's start with a history of build automation. So, where does all this build automation come from? Uh, well, at first we started with just a command line call to the compiler. It's as simple as that. Um, but multi-module projects pose a problem. Um, when you compile your projects, you, you have to deal with some order requirements. Um, first, uh, 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 a sample module should be compiled, and after that, following modules that maybe depend on the first module. So you can just compile all the way around. So in 1977, the tool Make was created, and you could def define your builds with so-called make files. Well, um, this, this was a long time ago, and uh, for the Java ecosystem, ENT was created, which, which was actually some sort of translation of make for Java. Um, and of course, Maven emerged a few years later, uh, also defining builds with XML, but adding uh, a concept of build lifecycle. So when you execute a build, it, it, it um, it executes a few tasks in a predefined order, so that, well, you know, your structure is not all over the place, like with Ant. Um, that what, that's what Maven tried to do. Well, XML is the language that Ant and Maven use. What can we tell about XML? Do, do you like XML? <laughs> Even remotely? I mean, let's start by being nice, shall we? I'm trying to be a good person here. XML excels at expressing hier hierarchies. It's a very, very difficult word to pronounce, hierarchical data. So it's like um, um, a graph um, or, well, some sort of graph um, data structure. So you can say this is, this is the top and there are levels beneath it, hierarchies. But build scripting logic actually isn't hierarchical. It, it doesn't easily fit a hierarchy. So, it often consists of conditional logic, of repeating logic. Some things need to be uh, executed over and over again. And come to think about it, this can be actually expressed much more concisely in a program programming language. And this is the thought behind uh, Gradle, uh, defining your build script in a programming language instead of XML. Well, let's call upon our first expert. What do you think Mr. Linus Torvalds thinks of XML? Does he like it? Does he hate it? Does he hate it with all of his strength he can muster? <laughs> he does. He says XML is crap. Really, there are no excuses. XML is nasty to pass for humans, and it's a disaster to pass, even for computers, there's just no reason for that horrible crap to exist. Whoa, he's got that out of his system, right? You should really check out his Google Plus profile, by the way. There are loads more of hilarious rants on all type of types of IT technology. So if you can spare an hour or so, it's hilarious from, from top to bottom. Um, XML is not the only thing that we don't like about uh, for example, the end build tool. Um, there are other things uh, we have to keep in, in mind when we think about evolution of build systems. And I'm talking about changes in requirements. So in the past, if you wanted to build a software system, you needed to compile it, package it. Well, that, that's really it. But modern uh, software systems, so, so not in the 70s, like we had at NS for a very long time, but um, modern build systems rely on much more technology. And one of the reasons is that in a single project, multiple programming languages are used. For example, you can think about web applications. 
Um, there needs to be a back end, there needs to be a front end, so the front end language will obviously differ from the back end language. So you need to do something about that. How do you compile or test these types of code with um, a not so very sophisticated build tool? It's, it's, well, it's hard, actually. So compiling still remains. Uh, running automated tests, also a thing we like to do, um, which is different from the past. We need to package our software still. And we want to integrate our code as early as possible so that bugs that we create, well, we don't create them, but well, we meet them anyway. Um, we, we get to know about them as soon as possible. And of course, when we're done, we want to deploy our software to test acceptance and production environments. And we want to make sure that we don't have to do much work about this. So it should be automatically. Well, the existing build tools, I thought it might be fun to place them head to head and see how they compare to each other and how they deal with um, these changing requirements that I talked about. And it's time to call upon our second expert, Mr. Mark Reynolds. He said uh, during a DevOps conference a few years ago something about Ant versus Maven. He said, what's the difference between Ant and Maven? The creator of Ant has apologized. <laughs> well, that's, that's a great thing to do, right? From the Ant creator. He said, yeah, I thought of Ant, and I'm sorry, it could have been a bit better, but, well, it isn't, and I'm sorry you guys still use it. Um, and the creator of Ant has never apologized, but I don't know if he has a reason to. We'll find out in the coming uh, 40 minutes. So, what can we say about these build tools? And let's put them head to head and let them face each other. Well, build script formats, we, also, uh, we talked a bit about this, Ant and Maven both use XML, and Gradle tries to uh, introduce some programming, programming language concepts by enabling you to use Groovy uh, to, use your, to define your build script. Um, and it enhances uh, the Groovy syntax by uh, uh, offering a domain-specific language, an API on which you can build your build scripts. More about that uh, later. Um, all three of these build systems support dependencies, but when you use end, you need to have the Ivy library present uh, to uh, define your dependencies. And Maven and Gradle uh, offer them uh, built in. Well, what if you want to create a build that is a multi-module project? Well, at NS, at the project that I'm working on right now, we used to do this with, uh, with end, and it was quite complex. I remember the first week that I started at the project and I, I had to take a look at the end code that was producing our multi-module builds. And it was over 3,000 lines. And I was literally crying, you know? I thought, where have they put me right now? I want to, I want to go away, but well, I didn't. And uh, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> I'm still alive, the project is still alive, um, but not thanks to this complex multi-module build, I can tell you that. Well, what if you wanted to follow a predefined structure? Well, I, I touched upon it a few minutes ago. Maven uh, can hand to you a structure. It says, here's my build lifecycle. Please use it and make sure that your project gets built uh, in this way. Uh, in end, well, structure is just absent. Every structure you want to use, you have to create yourself. So you have to think about build phases or build steps. Or and because it's not um, imposed, so uh, it, it's not um, um, required to use uh, a build structure. It can go, go, you know, every way you can imagine. Um, people have thought about this and created some structure, but it's not really um, evident that the structure is like it is. So it's very hard to get to know this structure if you don't know what it is beforehand. Um, and in Maven, well, you, when you open a new Maven project, you already know this build lifecycle. So it's, it's fairly obvious that the first thing that you need to do is compile and then compile your test classes and, and so on. And Gradle works kind of the same way. Um, what if you wanted to create a custom structure? Well, and consist fully of custom structures, so I, I, I put not applicable there. Um, with Maven, if you wanted to... Uh, uh, override the, ba the, the default structure and create your own custom structure. It's quite complex because you need to uh, use some plugin and, and tie it to a build phase and uh, lots of XML uh, um, configuration. Uh, it works, of course. At the end, it will work, but it's 
a bit more complex. And in Gradle, it's quite simple. And I will show you in a few minutes. Uh, so let's talk about verbosity. So how many lines of code do we need to write to achieve a particular goal? Well, with end, I can say with 100% certainty that verbosity is very high. You have to write a lot of XML code to achieve a few functionality uh, steps. Um, Gradle is kind of low. It tries to be uh, uh, not, not very verbose by um, uh, assuming a lot of things beforehand, so convention over configuration. And with Maven, I, I put average there, because um, when you stick to the basic structure, your Palm XML could be very short. Uh, but when you, when you want to adjust this structure, when you want to add something to it, when you want to switch a few phases or something, you, you should uh, add a few more uh, lines of XML code to your POM, so it's average. A learning curve, so uh, how many time does it take for a new uh, team member to, um, to get your, and your build scripting, to, to understand it? Well, I guess the learning curve with Maven is steep, so you can learn very quickly, um, because the structure is the same. Uh, with Ant, it's shallow. It it takes a long time for uh, a new team member to really understand all of the end scripting that we use. And with Gradle, it's, I think it's in between. Um, there is a predefined structure, so if you know that, you could just you know, uh, understand it quickly. But it's possible to um, create your custom structure very easily, so you need to adjust to that. Build order, well, uh, all these three tools uh, define a build order in some way, and in end, this is done by using depends on relations. So a particular end target can, can uh, define, depe I'm depending on another uh, target. Uh, with Maven, this is uh, controlled by life cycles. I've told, talked about that. Um, and with Gradle, it's kind of like depends on, but they call it directed acyclic graph, which means it depends on, and we make sure there are no cycles. So that it won't run forever. I will explain the, this graph thing uh, in a moment a bit more. Well, but first, I'm quite interested in how many of you uh, know Gradle or actually work with Gradle right now. Could you raise your hand, please, if you work with Gradle? It's like 10 people, 11. Thank you. People use Maven? That's like half of you. And people who are stuck with Ant still. Yeah. I was one of you guys uh, a year ago. Let's, uh, let's take a brief moment of silence for these brave souls. <laughs> Actually, when I was preparing this talk, I was at the DevOx conference in Belgium last year, in November. And um, um, this picture here is one of the whiteboards that were present at, at DevOx. And, I don't know if you've ever uh, seen a, a, an empty whiteboard um, in the presence of developers, but I have never seen one, because when you put an empty whiteboard in a team of developers, it gets, you know, it, it will become full very quickly. And the same thing happened here. They, they put these empty whiteboards in, in a hallway, and uh, half a day later it was, you know, scribbled full with all kinds of popularity contests, like left, uh, on the top left it says, do you like Angular? Yes, no. Um, hidden uh, behind the title, it says, do you like clean whiteboards? Yes, no. Well, four people like clean whiteboards, and <laughs> the majority doesn't like them. Uh, and I put this uh, little one here, Java build tools. It's, it's a bit small, sorry for that. Um, because I wanted to see how many people are actually using Gradle at the moment. And it's quite interesting to see that mm, this, um, these numbers actually match uh, uh, yours, because over a bit over half of the people are using Maven, a few are using Ant, and like 25% are using Gradle. So that's great to see. Um, well, what is Gradle? Now, for the people who have worked with Gradle before, I won't be telling anything new in, a, in the coming 10 minutes, but the people who are working with Ant, would, I guess they would like to see more about it. So let's do a quick introduction of Gradle. So it's a build system for the JVM. It has been developed since 2009. And it has become popular quite quickly because uh, when you start an Android uh, application project, Gradle is one of the first things that you see when your IDE suggests, would you like to choose a build system? And I guess Gradle has been the default uh, for quite some time. Um, I tried to 
investigate why Google uh, chose to Gradle as the default build tool, but I couldn't get any more answers just rather than they thought it was a nice build tool. So, what is Gradle? Um, so, I already touched upon this uh, briefly. You can define build in a, a Groovy based domain specific language and it uses build by convention. So, please specify as little as possible to make sure that you can. Um, build your project quickly and with uh, a limited uh, amount of lines of code. Well, customizing is very easy. You could just override a, a bit of uh, a, a convention and, and put your own value in it. Um, and if you want additional features that the, the basics of Gradle doesn't support, you can uh, plug in some plugins um, and they offer additional features. Well, there are two types of plugins. You could uh, use a plugin to support another JVM language like Groovy or Scala or uh, Kotlin, uh, or you could uh, use one to support some integration tooling like uh, Yacoco for your code coverage or Sonar or Findbox or what have you not. Gradle tries to um, apply incremental building, so when a, a certain step has already been finished uh, and nothing has changed in the meantime, well, don't do it again, just skip it. Skip whatever you can. Um, it's been widely supported, uh, fast and efficient. We'll, we'll return to that, uh, to that in, a, in a few minutes. Um, dependency management is quite advanced. I will show uh, a small example of it. And um, the directed acyclic graph uh, for uh, depending, uh, dependence relations. And actually, if you wanted to summarize this, you would say it tries to be flexible like, like ant. Uh, and it tries to uh, adhere to this structure, use this structure like Maven does. It tries to use the best of these two tools. So no XML at all. Please tell Lin Linus Torvalds this. He will be very happy. I guess he already knows, right? Okay. And this Gradle DSL offers you a build-oriented model. So you can access your, uh, your artifacts and all those things. Well, what does a sample Gradle build file look like? Well, like 25% of you already knows this, have seen the, these build scripts. This is an example build file. Uh, you define uh, a repository. This is for a Java project, actually. So you apply the Java plugin. And you, 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 just like in Maven, you, you uh, assign a group to your software and a version. You define the Java version that you're using. You need a repository to get your dependencies. So you could put your Nexus or your Artifactory here, or Maven Central, whatever you want. You define some dependencies, and you define where the source is. Well, that's a basic, quite a basic build script. So how do you get started? I want to show a quick demo project to show you how to get started. And there are a few things I would like to show you. Let's first define a build tag and try to extend an existing one. So here I have a sample build file. Um, this is not for a Java project. This is just a few tasks that I've defined myself. And the first thing says, hello from Gradle. Well, I guess you already know how this works. Um, so let's skip to this one. Um, this is a task that prints hello again. But I've defined that this one depends on the hello Gradle task. So when I run hello again, we will see that hello Gradle will first be executed after, and after that, hello again will be executed. So let's run this. Can you read this, uh, guys, in the back? Yeah? Okay. Well, there you have it. It runs hello Gradle, and it runs hello again. So that's quite simple. Um, this is an example that you you really gain a lot when you uh, do, don't use XML anymore. When you when you use uh, a programming language, and this time it's uh, it's Groovy, but um, you could choose another language if you want. I heard from Hadi this morning that in Gradle uh, version three, uh, this will be able to do with Kotlin. So not with Groovy, but with Kotlin. Um, it doesn't really matter. Uh, what you can do is you could do um, various constructs like iteration, and that's what we are we are doing here. Uh, the task count to four, well, simply counts to four. And um, this one does more or less the same, but 
Instead of four times, it, do, it will uh, do it three times, and uh, it will define a task, actually, with uh, a specific index. So this is like a lambda expression that says, please define this task with this index, and you know, do it three times. So actually, you could create dynamic tasks, which are not known to you or you know, the compiler at compile time, but when you run it, they will be created, they will be generated, actually. So let's, um, let's first run the count of four task. Well, I, I guess you all know what will happen. It will count to four, obviously. Um, what if you would, I haven't shown this yet, but um, you, could, uh, you can um, uh, get a report of all the tasks that Gradle knows, that Gradle knows about right now. And if you do that, you will see here that three tasks have appeared. And it's because I have created this, these dynamic tasks in this iteration statement. So it's, this is quite flexible. Um, so I have shown this advanced task with Groovy. Now, what if we would want to build our Java project with Gradle? Well, let's see how that works. So I open up my ID. I use Eclipse for now because at NS we use Eclipse because we're developing for the rich client platform of Eclipse, but this is just as easy uh, in IntelliJ or in NetBeans. So let's create a new project, which is a Gradle project. Let's call it Gradle Java. And let's use the Java quick start template, which generates uh, a build script template for us. Well, here it is. Oh, it's a very old template. I can see it right now. <laughs> so let's uh, let's switch that. Um, well, here is our uh, Gradle file for a Java project. This template uh, uh, contains one uh, data class. It's I guess it's called person, and there's also a test class that tries to test person class, so it's very basic. Um, when we want to build this one, we just call Gradle build. And then we'll compile everything. Well, they are done. Um, five seconds, but if you build it again, and this is what I've, I was talking about, um, it will skip everything that has been done before. So, incremental build. This one runs uh, a lot faster. Now, I've talked about uh, applying plugins, uh, like for uh, different languages or integration tools. So, let's apply a plugin for Jacoco, Jacoco to be sure that our code is covered 100% right. So, we apply the plugin Jacoco, and when we execute Gradle tasks, we see that a, tasks, a task had, has appeared, which is called Jacoco test report. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's not, oh, it's not visible. Sorry. Like that? Yeah. Better? OK. Thanks for the remark. <laughs> um, so let's run the Jacoco test report. I want to see my coverage, yes, as fast as possible. Let's see what it does. Well, actually, what it will do is it will skip the Jacoco test report phase. Hmm, that's strange. Why, why would it do that? Well, actually, it does this because in order to uh, calculate coverage, it needs some test results, some test data. And I haven't even run the test yet. So uh, we can solve this one with a dependency. We can say Jacoco test report depends on Let's say test. Something went wrong. Oh, typo. <laughs> there we go. Now let's run it again. Please give me some coverage. It skips it again. Not sure what went wrong there, here. Actually, uh, it has done test. I want to perform a clean just to be Sure, I'm not going nuts here, right? Well, okay. It has been run. And um, now if you wanted to, uh, 
view the report, of course. Gradle builds uh, a build directory. Everything Gradle builds will be in the build directory. And it will put some reports here. Well, we have the test report, which is generated by JUnit, and the Jococo report, which just contains some coverage information. So there you go. The coverage was, has been run, finally. So let's see where we were. We have defined a slot in the build order. How does Gradle handle a Java project? Well, we have seen that. Running unit tests, computing code coverage, and running an existing end target. Well, that's, that's the one that I want to zoom in uh, on next. Because um, when you have this much end scripting, you know, you obviously you can't, you can't replace it all. We tried to at the beginning. Uh, but uh, uh, to start, there was a lot of end scripting that wasn't even used anymore. So you know, delete it. And some of the end scripting was used once a month to deploy some artifacts to uh, uh, a test environment that wasn't used very often. So, you know, we didn't, um, we didn't even try to replace that. Um, and um, with that in mind, it could be very uh, convenient to run an existing end target. And, well, Gradle is also capable of doing that. So I created a build tool project from hell because it uses all three build tools available, and Maven and Gradle. I'm not sure what got into me, but well, I did it anyway. And this, um, this project is called Build Tool Overkill. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I've opened it right here. And um, well, this is actually the end. Uh, you know, I, I set out to program these three build scripts, and with the Gradle one, I finished in five minutes. Then I continued to the Palm XML of Maven. It was 10 minutes or something, and I worked two hours at this build script, this end build script, because, you know, I was, wasn't really used to all these directory properties and all those kind of things, so it was, it was really, really a pain. Um, but anyway, we can call these end tasks from our build Gradle script. Uh, let's open the, the right build Gradle, which is this one. Well, at first we say, and import build and define your build XML, and then, well, actually, then these, uh, these tasks will already be available. So I will show you quickly. So let's run Gradle tasks. And there you go. These tasks are the end tasks, so you can actually execute them if you want it. And of course, you can also still execute the Gradle tasks. So you could combine them in a way that is, well, if it's convenient for you, you can. So we did this a few times at the NES because we really didn't want to uh, replace end scripting with a Gradle that is very complex and only used once a month or something. Well, that's just not worth it, you know? So, okay, so let's get per back to our story. Uh, this, I, I already told this. Um, oh, yeah, I've done a quick profiling session on these, uh, uh, these three uh, build tools because, well, I had them all in my project, you know, so why not? It's not really official, you know, I just uh, executed everything 10 times and took the average. Uh, what you can see is the, the gray uh, bars are Gradle. And the above section is first do a clean and then do, uh, in order, a publish, coverage, compile, and test. And the, the bottom one is, um, well, just don't clean, so uh, take advantage of anything you've done before, so perform an incremental build. Uh, well, uh, and does it really the same? You know, it's, 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 uh, it's just as long in both cases because end doesn't even support incremental building, so that's, that's very uh, logical. Well, Maven is, is uh, the slowest of the three, um, and Gradle is slower than Ant in the beginning when it needs to do a clean, but when it has remembered that, there, uh, that it can skip a few steps, uh, perform an incremental build, then it's the fastest of these three build tools. So, just for fun, you know. So, what did we do at NS, at the Dutch Railways? This is one of our magnificent uh, trains, by the way. In yellow and in blue. That's why the background changes to yellow right now. These are uh, DNS colors. Well, this wasn't a greenfield project at all. I told you before, we inherited some end scripting. People persuaded us and said, this is very good. And well, actually, it was very complex and very verbose. Um, in total, this system is a one million lines of code. So and Java, uh, all these things together. And I told you before, 20K lines of end scripting. 30 software developers working on this system right now. 
the system behaved like a monolith. Uh, and also uh, on the build server, our Jenkins server uh, triggered a build every time one tiny line in one module was changed and everything was built again. So that was, well, it cost us a lot of time. And we tried to, uh, to face that when doing the Gradle migration to make sure that these things could run independently. So what was our migration strategy? Well, the first one is actually quite simple, and I hope you, you guys have done this already in your projects. Please define your project into components according to functionality or something, so that you can say this project, well, the project that we are working on, uh, has something to do with the planning of the trains. That's one component. Uh, the, the component that I'm working on is uh, responsible for making sure that these trains actually uh, are there at the station, you know, uh, at, at the right uh, place. Uh, that they're not at uh, another platform or something. That's another component. So please divide these things so that you, when you are migrated, you can say if there is a change in one component, please just only build this component and not the rest with it. And please start, well, gradling. We made it into a verb now, you know, gradling. Please start gradling at a small isolated part where you have uh, not many dependencies. So uh, we started at a very small component, which was a generic component, and it didn't depend on anything, just on itself. We started there, and we, we went from there and took on more components as we went. And please focus on code that is used regularly. I've said this a few times. Please don't try to spend a week or something to migrate something that is only used once a month, because you won't really earn back your, your investment. Your return on investment will be, well, negative. So. Uh, please focus on code that is used on a daily basis. So the compile process, um, uh, the, the automated testing, uh, the coverage, these things that run at, in your build server after every commit, please focus on that. And verify after each step that a few things still hold true, that the results are actually the ex exactly the same as before, and that no problems occur in existing encode, encode that you might not migrate because it's used too little. So in our case, we actually uh, did a bitwise compare of the jar files, because when we didn't do that, the existing encode would complain that manifest files were not having the right values and all those things. So we really <coughs> went through these jars, the Gradle generated one, the end generated one, and tried to compare them and make sure that they were exactly the same. And I've told this a few times, please don't fool yourself. Not every single line of encode should be replaced. Uh, just the ones that will um, well, make you happy and will make sure that you will develop a lot faster. And of course, I had to explain all of this to a few project managers as well. So you, I, I could go in the room and say, I want, we want to replace all our 25,000 lines. But well, you would say, yeah, now you're just kidding. Oh no, I'm not going to allow that. So replace a good bit, not everything, because well, you have to deal with project managers, right? And they want to see some positive return on investment. So you just have to be a little practical also. Um, well, I, uh, I showed you that end projects are first-class citizens, so you can just reuse those tasks if you want. Well, this wasn't really done in a day or so, uh, more like a few months, and there were a few challenges that we had to face. So let's talk about that for a short while. Dependency spaghetti. Our project suffered from dependency spaghetti. You know, jar files were all over the place. And in the end scripting, we were building temporary workspace directories all over the place. And well, I guess I, I, first, I started off, I've, I sat a few days and I tried to merge all these, 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 these workspace directories into one and try to make some. You know, I hope, I hope when you migrate your project that is not such a mess as what we encounter, encountered. Um, but please make sure that your dependencies are declared in one place, that there are no, no duplicates, that they are transitive, that you don't, well, and all those things. So, uh, and at the beginning, see which end code could, you know, still uh, be, uh, remain, um, because it's not used very often, and try to make it collaborate with what you have um, substituted for Gradle code. And after each step, please, run your continuous integration, continuous delivery, and make sure that not only the module that you've just uh, um, migrated, but also the other modules that maybe still run on end code uh, still work. And repeat, you know, and repeat until most of it is done. Well, so what's the result of the migration? Well, when a, a person starts in our team, the responsibility of a component is more clear. 
So you can understand it quickly, uh, more quickly. And a build will only run if a particular component has changed. So we had very uh, less build time on our build service. Um, we run unit tests in parallel. Oh, I haven't told about you about this, but um, Gradle can decide whether to run a few unit tests in parallel. Actually, it tries to uh, uh, compute the best strategy, whether to run in parallel or not. In end, this is also possible, but you need to predefine it, and Gradle just does this on the fly, so that's it's great. Um, I've already told this, behave transit transitively dependencies. So, the hard numbers. What are the results? Well, I guess we replaced just over 10,000 lines, actually, at the end. And this was the part that really was used on a daily basis, the part that really slowed us down, and the part that we, uh, well, we can't say we're, it's slowing us down anymore, but because now it has been transformed into 1,232, yeah, 1,232 lines of Gradle code. So. Verbosity has gone uh, down quite a lot, and there's, of course, there's still some end scripting left, and maybe we'll migrate it in the future, uh, but I can't promise anything because I still have these project managers, you know, <laughs> who keep, they keep asking me questions about this. Um, I would love to, you know, replace all of it, uh, but we have to be practical also and, and think, well, will we win time or will we just lose time? And here's our third expert. You've been waiting for this, haven't you? Mr. Louis van Gaal, what does he think about migrating all end code? Well, I don't know if you ever saw an interview with him uh, you know, when he was uh, a manager at Bayern München in Germany or when he was a manager now in, uh, in Manchester. But this guy thinks he can speak all languages fluently, and it's, it's hilarious. <laughs> um, so he transla literally translates Dutch um, sayings, Dutch proverbs, and tries to um, translate them into English. So this is what he said when um, uh, some reporter asked him, this was an easy opponent, now you're facing Chelsea, it will be much harder, what do you think? And he said, in the Netherlands they say that is another cook, which literally means it's another biscuit, you know, something you eat. Uh, in, in, in Dutch this means it will be a lot harder, it will be a whole different story. Well, this guy, well, he's hilarious, you should watch his YouTube. Uh, well, I was laughing so hard, it's great. It's great stuff from uh, Louis van Gaal. So don't migrate all IAM code, that's the bottom line. Just migrate the things that you will benefit from. Well, th this monitor is flashing at me, so let's wrap up, shall we? What can we say about Ant and Maven? Well, Ant mostly. Most of the things I've told you were about Ant because, well, we can all agree Ant is just not really that likable. Um, with Maven, it's a different story. It could be some for really verbose, but you know, if it's working and if all these technical depth things that I've told you are not present, well, there's no reason why you shouldn't keep it. Um, but we can still say that the purpose of a code fragment, especially in Ant's case, is not clearly evident, not at the beginning. And they often fail to address changing requirements, requirements in build tooling that I've told you about, and they rely heavily on XML, and Linus Torvalds doesn't like XML, and neither do we. So Gradle is a better alternative. Well, what does it offer? Structure, flexibility. It really tries to combine the power of both Ant and Maven. Integrate with almost anything. I haven't seen anything that doesn't integrate with Gradle as of now. So, wow, no drawbacks whatsoever. Well, that's just too good to be true. And it really is, because um, there are drawbacks. Of course, there are drawbacks. Uh, Gradle spends quite a lot of time on configuration parsing. I did this demo, uh, I think, uh, 10 months ago with Gradle 2.4. And um, well, then they, had, they hadn't improved on performance. So when you started the build script, it took you five, six seconds, and then, wow, it finally got to work. So uh, it wasn't really fast at all. But in the past versions, I guess they are now at 2.13. They have really improved on these performance things. So you still have to wait a bit at the first build, um, but after that, it gets faster. So this is a drawback. Uh, well, and as with every new technology, this also applies your developers, you will get, you have to get used to it, and it will be different, so you need, you need to, to learn about it, and it will take some time and some effort. Well, and this, the last one is something that I've experienced, you know, firsthand. It's a lot of work. If you want to migrate everything, it's a lot of work, so choose the bits that you, that you can benefit from the most. You can discover all kinds of uh, errors in your existing code, and you all have to solve them in order to 
fully migrate your, uh, your scripting. So. The final question, should my project use Gradle? Well, if you start a brand new project tomorrow, then I will say, just do it. Do it right now, and not, don't wait. Because it's a green field, you can do anything you like, and Gradle is a great build tool. If you have an existing project, well, you have to ask yourself some questions. Will you benefit from Gradle's key features? Do you need better performance, uh, incremental builds? Do you need better maintainability? And do you want your build scripting to be less verbose? Well, if you want it, then you could migrate. But please keep in mind, do you have any technical debt to solve? Do you have dependency spaghetti, like uh, we did? Please make sure you first do something about that and then try to migrate. So remove duplicates, uh, use an artifact repository, divide your project. I hope you've all done this uh, already, but you can do it uh, after the talk, that's no problem. Define a clear structure in your build project, because if you have defined a clear structure, also an end, it will be a lot easier to migrate to Gradle after that. Well, are there any questions? I guess we have time for one or two questions. Is there a microphone uh, in, the, in the room? No? I will repeat it. That's no problem. Yeah, so the question is, how do you convince your manager to really do this migration and not hire a person to, to, uh, to keep working on the existing scripting, right? Well, yeah, in our case, it was, it was quite easy because uh, our end scripting uh, couldn't be uh, put through, the, through uh, the build server uh, in one component. It, just, it could just put the whole system at once. So we made, we made a, um, a report that said, this is the amount of time that one build takes. It was like well, over one hour or something. And if we could just bring this back to component level, and we did, we did a proof of concept with Gradle. Um, and yeah, these, these were the over one hour can be reduced to like 20 minutes or, or 15 minutes. And, and this time on the build servers that we can uh, win um, will, be, uh, uh, will reduce your costs because you won't need as much build servers as we do right now. So we tried to express it in terms of you know, costs. And then he said, well, you can do a proof of concept. Well, while the proof of concept was working, he said, well, maybe you can extend a few things. So that is how we went. <laughs> yeah, wow, yeah. Several hours, that's, wow, that's, that's, yeah. I would cry if I would see that, so. <laughs> um, how many, sorry, I didn't. That's code. That's end code. Well, we, I guess we. In, uh, I don't have the exact number, but I guess it was about two or three thousand lines, which were never used anywhere. So. Uh, it's also in our slides you mentioned that there is no, there is no custom structure. So um, basically, uh, what do you understand by custom structure in AMP? Because you can write plugins in AMP as well. Yeah. You can, you can, of course you can, and but but our end scripting didn't use these pr these plugins, so we didn't have any structure at all. But we, you know, when you have some structure, well, it could work for you. You know, I'm not telling you please migrate right now. <laughs> but well, yeah. So um, to be complete, I have some further reading. If you like to, the first article is a great one by Benjamin Mushko. He also compares Gradle to Ants and Maven and tells a few things about it. So read it if you're interested. Uh, Gradle has great documentation. Uh, the Gradle website is a great one. So, and the, the two uh, example project I've put on GitHub, the build tool overkill and the getting started project. If you want to check it out. Can you wrap Maven code as you did with Ant? Sorry. Can you wrap Maven code as you did with Ant? You can uh, run Maven. Yeah, you can. Yeah. I don't have time to show it, but th you can. Yeah, if you want. Well, that will be it. Thank you very much for your attention.